Tony Parsons. Uh, this is a communication. It's from Tony. Tony, uh, this is communication which illuminates the paradoxical nature of non-duality and exposes the deluded idea that it's something that can be acquired and experienced. Uh, half of the speakers here um, attended Tony's meetings, <laughs> somewhere or the other, and uh, he's considered the uh, the the father of uh, contemporary non-duality. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Ooh. Wow, Tony. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, everyone, Tony Parsons. Go ahead, Tony. Okay. So um, I imagine already that uh, you've listened to quite a lot of explanations and you will go on listening to them in the next few day or so. So I thought instead of explaining anything at all, I'd tell a little story about a carpet. And the story is that Claire and I lived together some time ago in a cottage in Wiltshire. And I was sitting, standing in, in the sitting room there, standing looking out at the view. And then I looked down at the carpet. And as I looked down at the carpet, suddenly everything went. Everything. I went. There wasn't anything. It was as though nothing was happening. And the carpet was simply the personification of what is. It was just what is. There was no one. It was just carpet, carpeting. And uh, but, so that, that happened and it wasn't, um, it wasn't a, a, a glimpse. It seemed to pervade this and thereafter that's how it was. As though there, all there was was just everything happening. Everything was just happening as it is without anyone in it. So later on, I had a thought, I thought about all of this, and I, I sort of went back over my, my past, which now seemed to have been lost. The lost, the past seemed to have not been there anymore. But I, I thought about my past, and I thought about as I was a little child, and, uh, and then uh, contraction seemed to arise, self-awareness arose, and then I felt like I was an individual, a real individual, and that everything that was happening was also real. And I grew up in that, that world, that dualistic world. And then I also realized that I was experiencing things like the sky as real, the trees as real, other people as real, the world as real, um, thoughts as real, feelings as real feelings. And all of these things seemed to be happening to me. I was experiencing them. And in some way or other, in experiencing them in this way, I seemed to take ownership of them. They became mine. They became my, it became my sky. In a way, it was my sky because I saw it in that way. And the trees and people, relationships and all of that seemed to be something that was happening to me. And, and that, as I grew up, of course, I became wealthier and wealthier with all, <laughs> with all these experiences. And I took them on myself. They, they were there, carried in my body, as they are with anybody, when, when it's, it's a sense of, of them being real and happening to me. And so uh, that, that all went on for, for many years, actually, in that, way, in that dualistic way, all of that was going on. Um, and then later on, I became somehow not happy with, with the way things were in that I felt that I was separate to everything that I was experiencing. So I then decided I needed to do something about that. And what I tried to do was to become, in simple terms, to become liberated, so-called liberated. But of course, because everything else was happening to me and seemed to be mine, I then also saw that liberation was another object which I could experience, like the sky and the trees and all of that. And somehow I would be able to take in uh, liberation as, an, as, again, something for me. Um, all of that was going on and I was going to various teachers and so on and, uh, and doing various things. Gurdjieff, Uspensky, all that lot. Nisikadata, um, Osho. And I was sort of involved in all of that in somehow a way, in some way hoping that, 
that the liberation would happen to me and it would be my liberation. But then um, I, I, when I was looking at all this, I, I realized that this whole event with the carpet, how significant it was, that somehow I'd come all those years with that great collection of experiences and I'd looked at that carpet and suddenly that carpet simply sucked everything out of me. It was as if that's how I felt it was. And everything that I thought I was and everything I thought I owned simply evaporated <laughs> into the carpet. That's how, that's how it seemed to me at the time. And there was nothing left, nothing left of the individual who had all those experiences, nothing left of the idea that I was real and that the world was real. All of that simply fell away and all that was left was nothing being everything. And since that time, I've, I've tried to communicate this to people. And so here we are again tonight, communicating to people. So if there's a question, let's answer it. Thank you, Tony. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tony, this is from an anonymous question. Why is Ooh. the me motivated to attend in and to listen to the Nothing Conference? Could it be that the me might anticipate a benefit from non-duality in order to improve its life? Although the open secret message communication very clearly that it is an empty shop and no spiritual lollipops are given to me. <laughs> so the me, directly the me takes form, the me, the self takes form, it is needy. So it's, it's continually seeking something that will fill its need, as I did when I was Tony Parsons. Um, <laughs> And, and that need is, is many, many fold. There's many, many different things that people, you, if you see your friends or see the world we live in, you see people trying to grasp everything they can to themselves uh, because they're so needy, having lost, having seemingly lost oneness, their need is very great. And so they're constantly, um, drawing things into themselves and then when they hear that there's a possibility that they might be able to find something even deeper um, and also may be able to resolve the problem of being feeling separate and they're attracted to that as i was but the problem is the great problem is in dualism is that the individual seeker objectifies everything so the individual seeker would objectify liberation or the end of separation and try to take it on for itself so that it would liberation would happen to it and that's the problem that's what makes the whole of seeking completely futile because what is longed for is completely beyond anything to do with the individual it's about the end of individuality liberation is about the end of separation and, and all that's left is, is, is what is happening. There's no one in that. There's no one that knows what's happening. There's no one that experiences what's happening or senses what's happening. There's no one left. All there is is what seems to be happening. Bam. <laughs> Andreas, hi, Tony. Lately, I often hear the new fashion word, no thing. I can understand that if I understand no thing intellectually, that there is no thing. But the whole thing is, as you describe it, something energetic. And if I can't do anything, why do we all come together here on the theor theoretical level and discuss no thing? Thank you. Well, why do we? Because the, the, the no thing can't be discussed. It is, it is literally no thing. So if it's no thing, there's nothing to talk about. It's, in another way, you could say it's no possibility. No thing is no possibility. But the strange uh, quality of all of this, or the reality that we live in, is that no thing is also everything. So this is where, when it becomes very confusing for the seeker. But no thing is everything. And everything that manifests, everything you're looking at at the moment, is no thing manifesting as that. And, and so... 
there's a fascination, obviously, when people hear about no thing, thinking it's some sort of wonderful answer to everything. In a way, it, it is everything, but it's not an answer because there aren't any answers. All there is is no thing as a thing. Thank you. Um, George <coughs> goes, where do I get a piece of that carpet? <laughs> I've got some downstairs. I can post one to you, but they cost a lot of money. <laughs> if you go to our website, we sell them for two thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> this is an anonymous question. After having been a seeker for for many years, trying to become enlightened and lose my ego, when we now learn about the open secret and nothing. Does the me evaporate and only non-duality is left, or do we just change concepts and words? Oh, God, no. This is not has anything to do with concepts or words. It's also nothing to do with you, how you are, or how you aren't. It's got nothing to do with any condition. It needs no condition because it already is everything. Um, and that, that again, is, is a paradox in a sense. But everything you sit in, everything that's happening, is the beloved already and and you are in it but because you think it is a something then you're somehow uh, separate from it which is which is unsatisfying but the longing for it is is a longing for no thing and everything and that it can't be it can't be experienced because it's beyond experience it's beyond individuality it is already what is and it's simply the uh the vanishing or the ending of, of the sense of being a separate individual that, that can seem to arise. Uh, but when it does arise, all it actually is, is the ending of an illusion anyway. So it's as though when that illusion ends, as it did with me when I was looking at the carpet, it's as though nothing happens at all. There isn't anything that happens because all that's all, the, all, all that, that is, is the end of an illusion that was never real anyway. So uh, there is nothing that happens. Uh, but, but what seems to you, what you could say is that what seems to happen is the, is the end of something in the individual that wants something to happen. <laughs> Here's another uh, uh, comment about the carpet. I pay lots of money for the two by two swatch of that carpet. <laughs> <laughs> this one is from John. Hello, Tony. I was raised to believe that I am real and everything that happens is real. When I hear the open secret message, something happens inside. Something seems to break down. It feels devastating. I have heard you say that the message is not so much about the words, but about an energetic happening. Is devastation an energetic happening? Um, no, I, for me, it feels as though devastation is more an emotional experience. Um, the, the vanishing of me uh, uh, is, is not something that's experienced. It's nothing to do with the individual at all. And uh, it feels to me as though your know, feeling of devastation is, low, is like a frustration. Um, the sudden ending of anything that's real is something that simply happens energetically. For me, it was very clear that day that there was nothing to do with any sort of explanations about life or about um, the nature of the, the being or, or about seeking or about dropping anything. The whole thing was something that was energetic. And so it, you can listen to all these explanations and you can watch YouTube and understand all the concepts. But even if there is a deep understanding of what we're talking about with non-duality, uh, in the end, that is all that me has. It is still a me that has now a deep understanding of so-called non-duality. The actual sudden evaporation of the illusion of individuality is something that happens energetically and you there's nothing that can be done about it damn it is, it is like um, <laughs> it is that some people have experiences in their in their separate lives 
of, of, of not being a person. In deep sleep, of course, in deep sleep there is no one. And in events in the day, there can be uh, very extreme events or, or beautiful music or something where the whole sense of the me seems not to be there, but it wouldn't be noticed. It, really, it is just that, that that isn't there anymore. So, and the other thing that um, is, very, um, is very much like in nature, what we're talking about here is falling in love. Falling in love, uh, really falling in love is as though there, there is a blessed someone there and you could write a list of things that you like about that person um, and, and that would be a, an explanation of what you like about them but there's something else there's something else intangible about that love which is very much like oneness Thank you so much. Um, John asks, in the No Thing conference, there are many people who have something to say about non-duality. It seems to me that there are many uh, providers of non-duality that actually seems to teach non-duality, which the open secret message does not do. Are there different ways of views of non-duality? No, there is no, there is no use of non-duality because non-duality is not a, a something. Non-duality is a term which points to a paradox. It's a term which points to empty fullness, the everything and the nothing. It's the things that can't be known or, or, or in any sense understood. So the whole um, idea that non-duality could be taught or, <laughs> or learnt or that you could, or, or that it is a state that you could experience is utterly ludicrous. It comes out of, um, out of a mis total misconception about the nature of non-duality. That's why recently there's been a, um, a new opening to the whole sense of non-duality, which uh, doesn't, um, doesn't recognize that there's such a thing as an individual to teach. Therefore, it doesn't offer any sort of seeking. And it also goes along with the wonderfully joyful news <laughs> that the whole of existence is completely without meaning or purpose because it's no thing appearing as this as this reality so that what's beautiful about that is that that's absolute freedom there is no meaning there's no purpose there's no one it just is what is that's absolute freedom already and all there is is absolute freedom already and there are people chasing around trying to find it, and there are other people trying to teach it. How can you teach absolute freedom? How can you teach empty fullness? How can anybody become empty fullness? Well, where would they come from to become empty fullness? It's already all there is. It's beautiful, Tony. Um, oh. Matt goes, I just wanted to thank you. No matter how, try, how hard I try, there is no question here. I'm so grateful to be utterly hopeless. That's from Matt. Oh, is that somebody saying that? Yeah, that was oh, Matt. That's that's yeah. Oh, so yeah. I do? <laughs> By Matt. Okay. That's ben, ben, hi, Tony. What advice can you give us for self-investigation? I know there's no, no me or practice, but in the world of ignorance and illusion, there is an investigation that has to happen. The paradox, thanks. Okay, so there is no self to investigate. So that's the end of the answer, really. <laughs> there is no self to investigate. In your world, in the world of the self, we all, we're all familiar with self-investigation, self-assessment, uh, therapies that are working with the self in order to have a more powerful and effective self. All of that is pure dualism and has nothing to do with the open secret at all in that sense, except that it's seen in the open secret. It's seen in this, that all that effort and all that separation is all part of wholeness. It isn't a separate thing. It is wholeness taking that form. It is nothing... Um, involving itself in self-investigation <laughs> but all of it's completely meaningless for that answer tony 
Anonymous um, states, watching the news, it appears that there are more dramatic things happening, like corona, global warming, overpopulation, economic crisis, and much more. At the same time, the willing, willingness of people to find common solutions seem to decrease and the show and, and the shown aggressiveness of many people seem to increase. Could you comment on this development? It's simply part of the, of the, of the dualistic world. Dualism is conflict. Dualism is good and evil, in and out, above and below. It simply is a state that people experience, most people in the world experience. So obviously out of that would, would come conflict of varying sorts, varying amounts, varying intensities. It seems at this time there's quite an intense um, amount of conflict. And I also get, and I wrote about this in my last book, This Freedom, I also get the sense that the me, the self, that whole dualistic energy is um, in some way or other in crisis. It's as though it's, uh, there's a huge anger in the world. There's a huge demand for answers to why people feel separate. There's a huge amount of work going on psychologically with people uh, in the world, scientific study of the person or the individual and the brain and so on. There's a lot of enlightenment in, in, uh, in, in therapy, in people who work with the mind and the brain. And uh, in some way or other, we're reaching a sort of crisis. I don't know what the result of that will be, but certainly everything is becoming more and more intense. That's, that's for me why um, uh, in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, because that energy has risen so much and there's been so much openness in the world these days, about everything. There's a much more talk about there being no thing. Scientists are studying no thing. So there's all of that is arising and there's much more of an openness uh, in individuals these days about all sorts of possibilities. That's why I think that was the time when this particular contemporary non-dual message has been uh, made available. Thank you, Tony. Not by anyone. There isn't anything out there. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a non dual God or anything like that. But in some way or other, that energy has brought up that message. Thank you. Here's another comment about uh, another comment. Magic carpet, bring it to your next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the next time we do a talk, I'll have, the, I'll have a bit of the carpet hanging up on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, Anz asks Is Eckhart Tolle a fraud? No, no, no. There's a lot of people very sincerely working out there uh, in the way they do, and it simply is that they're deluded, that's all. Uh, but they very, I get the sense that, that most of them are very sincerely... I think what's happened is that in some way or other they've had an experience of some sort, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but in some way or other they've had an, uh, what they would call a spiritual experience of some sort. They presume that they are enlightened, or anyway, they're trying to help other people have the same experience that they have. Eckhart Tolle, very clearly, if you watch him and listen to him, is trying to help other people to have the same experience as he does. And there are many people who are who are doing that in, in the world of seeking. Um, and people who also profess to seek non-dualism probably do it quite sincerely. It simply is a delusion. Thank you for that. Art asks, are there liberation or energetic experiences? I'm going to repeat. Are there liberation or energetic experiences like those you had as a seeker that still happen to the apparent character, Tony, now, even though they have lost a sense of significance? No, there's nothing here that would happen like that. When, when I was a, a seeker, when I was Tony Parsons, a person, there were glimpses happening here and there, but they don't have they don't have to be glimpses at all. But I know of many people because I speak to them who do have glimpses. But but of course to say that they have glimpses is not quite correct. Because the, when there's a glimpse, there's nothing. So there isn't anybody in the glimpse. 
but obviously afterwards when they seem to come back or they don't as i didn't um, but when they do seem to come back they have a memory or a sense of what seems to have happened and i noticed i wrote about a glimpse in, in the open secret but i noticed that really my my record of that glimpse wasn't that glimpse it was only a, a memory of it an attempt to to try and remember it, bring it um, remember it. in that glimpse i was walking in a park and there were trees and in that glimpse unconditional love was so amazing it was so incredible that there was no way that it could ever be described but that you could see that or it could be seen that that was all there was thank you. <laughs> thank you tony uh so the one that speaks and the one listening are really not there but just happen without control yeah there isn't anyone well, there isn't anyone. You're not there. I'm not here. There isn't anyone. There just is what seems to be happening. All there is, is what seems to be happening. Beginning and end. This is from Robert. Robert asks, when the end of the road of seeking happens a lot, happens a lot of friends drop off because their needs agendas are not being met. The end of the road journey is not a dead end as they would perceive it, but a relief from the longing. Hmm. But also, uh, all the time you're in the dualistic world and you have friends in the dualistic world, you all play games together. It's stroke my ego and I'll stroke yours. That's one of the games. There are some other ones. <laughs> it's not only an ego trip. But when, when one of those people in that gang falls away and is no more a person, then they, they, they're, they're not playing any games anymore because they don't have an ego to stroke <laughs> or exchange stroking with other people. The whole thing's over as far as the individual is concerned. There's no longer an individual game or response happening from that one person. And other people find that confronting. And some, sometimes friends are lost because the, 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 that person is no longer playing their game. In fact, you see everything is lost. Uh, when there is no one with the carpet that day, everything was lost. Everything that I, I was trying to describe that I thought I had was simply lost and there was nothing left. And when there's nothing left, then there's everything. <laughs> Isa goes, I love your description of the dance between meing and being, and that meing tries to own the being. Would you say that this dance is the play of life? Uh, no, it's the play of energy. It's simply energy taking different forms. And uh, a lot of people prior to the, the, their end, or you know, they're not being anyone, a lot of people go through that sort of experience. I did as well. Uh, I, there was often near the end some sense of um, of there being nothing, simply the absolute simplicity of there being nothing but what was happening. All there was was what was happening. And then Tony would come back in and say, hey, what about a cup of coffee or whatever? Um, whatever would come up. And then the story would begin again. And then there'd be no story. And then there'd be a story. And there'd be no story. And then there'd be a story. And then one day, all there is is no stop. Which is indescribable, of course. Which can't be described. Or no. Is there a difference between realizing that everything is nothing and dying personally? No. The personal death for most people is, uh, is, is a, an experience of them having to die because they still live in the dream of being a self so myself is going to die now and then there comes a point when there's no nothing that supports that whole uh, illusion that you are someone that's going to die and all that's left is what is and then at that point it's realized there never was a you that ever died nobody ever dies 
and all there is is what is but it's too late to ring your friend and tell them <laughs> and anyway it can't be told this has died and all that's left is what is happening but i can't tell anybody what that's like there's no way that that can be described the nearest i can come to it when i'm talking to people is to to try and sort of undo their deluded idea of the soul but no thing can't be described the nearest you can get to it i think is to say that all there is is what's apparently happened very simple it's very simple all there is is what's apparently happened so if you're in a confusion about what's going on in your life emotionally or whatever and to do with what we're talking about here that's actually quite a good thing to say well all there is is what's happening it's very simple it's not happening to anyone it's not sense it's just happening Apparently. <laughs> um, this one is really funny. Does the carpet come with the smoldering outline of Tony's slippers where he once stood? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. It ha it'll happen one day. <laughs> <laughs> Good questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Maharaj talked a lot about being earnest and having a string desire for liberation. No, what is there sorry. we can do to get to the supreme oh, state? No. If we carry on the illusion without any investigation, then we will remain in bondage. So questioning the me and the I will help the final understanding, or do we just do nothing and carry on with our lives? Okay, so there is no teaching. There is nothing that can be done. And there is no one who can choose to just carry on with their lives. How are you going to do that? You haven't ever lived. You haven't ever chosen to do anything. All that's all of all of your past, as I learned, is simply something that's happening. You you don't have it real. The experiences you have are about something being real, as I had, and 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 then you think that that, that is real and that's a real experience that you're having. But, the, but in reality, there isn't anybody that experiences anything. There isn't anybody that chooses anything. There is only what is happening, what is apparent. Yeah. The whole idea of the Mahawar saying that you need to develop yourself in this way or that way is all part of the dualism of teaching. It's the teaching of becoming, which is abundant all over the world and completely deluded. Uh, R asks, the illusion of separation is the dream and the reason for apparent pain, efforts to change oneself, others, and the world, the beloved everywhere. Could you comment on this game and how we can grasp this kind of humor or, not or nothingness? Feeling separate is the basis of the dream and very painful. Why do we do so much? Uh, well, we do a lot because we're seeking a lot. Directly, we become separate. We are very active in the seeking world and that could be seeking pleasure and avoiding pain seeking all sorts of distractions to avoid the sense of being separate but it's a very active what what you see in the world is people avoiding being separate it's it simply is, is the activity of the seeker and it isn't that the seeker is only a seeker of spiritual goals or whatever it's everybody in the world who is separate is a seeker but they seek many many as you can see in the world <laughs> there are many things that are sought and it's a huge activity and the whole of the marketplace is feeding that activity but in the spiritual world there's also a spiritual marketplace where there are many many different forms of activity that you can about uh, abide in on the in the deluded idea that one day you will you will become in life it's a huge field anonymous asks what happens when the body dies what will this be like well it won't be like anything because it's, it'll be like now because the body is simply a thing that arises in the whole and what is 
what is actually also arising is what's happening. So when the body dies, all that will be left is what is actually apparently happening. Canon <laughs> uh, asks, though it is known that I am not the body or the mind, and the experience of no self has happened, my mind is strong and will not give up its concepts and determination to know that. How can one drop the mind? No, you can't. No, there's nothing that can be done. Um, and if the, if the mind is active, then that is what's happening. There's nothing right or wrong with anything. There is only uh, no thing arising as something that seems to be happening, including having a very active mind. It's, it's what it is. Don't you fight it or make it wrong, you're giving it energy. And it loves that. So it's like feeding it, feeding it with energy. I must get rid of the mind or I must get rid of desire. I mean, in the Buddhist world, there's actually a meditation to end desire. Uh, there's a meditation which, which seeks to end desire. So there's a real intense desire not to desire. It's just a farce, the whole thing. It's a mess. <laughs> Having no desire is still a desire. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Anonymous goes, lots of gurus say that nothing can be done to attain the shift in consciousness. Do you agree? What differentiates those seekers for, the, for whose the shift happens and those that it did not happen to? Or is this completely random? It's not random because it's all there is already. It's not something that happens like a like an explosion in the sky here there and everywhere or whatever it is all there is the only confusion is is for the individual who thinks that they don't have it and that because they think it's something that they can have but actually all there is is oneness that it simply is the whole whole of this reality is simply oneness in different forms so there isn't anybody that will get it. There isn't anybody that is in a lottery waiting for it because it already is. It's not something that happens. Thank you. Andreas is asking, if no thing is no possibility, does this hint at, the f at that free will and choice are illusory? Yes, that's what he exactly points out. Absolutely. Why would there need to be free will and choice if there's no possibility? Incidentally, it's quite a good expression that I was listening to something to do with science the other day, and they were talking about nothing. And they said that the nearest description that they can get of nothing is no possibility, which I think, if you think about it, it's quite an interesting concept. So what we have is no possibility and every possibility, and both are one. Christy asks, hi, Tony. I've had a few experiences of wholeness when I listen to you. Something asks me, what if I'm awake? I feel nausea when I consider contemplating that. Any advice? When you're contemplating death, there's nausea. Contemplating, uh, I'll repeat the question. Hi, Tony. I've had a few experiences of wholeness. When I listen to you, something asks me, what if I'm awake? I feel nausea when I consider contemplating that. Uh, Oh, that. That, that oh. Any advice? Yeah. No, that's what's happening. <laughs> um, there is, I give no advice to anyone. There is no advice because there is nobody to advise. W what I speak, I speak out of nothing and I speak to nothing. But the nothing I speak to sometimes pretends it's something. <laughs> um, but he gets no answers or no satisfaction at all. This is the worst possible message for the seeker. Anonymous, can you talk about your meeting with Maharaj, please? I've never, I don't think I've ever had a meeting with Maharaj. <laughs> I, I've studied Nisikadatta, but I've never had a meeting with Maharaj. What? No. And then anyway, so what? In Maharaj, there is no Maharaj. All there is, is what seems to be happening. So 
meeting the Pope or meeting Maharaj or meeting Joe Bloggs or meeting anyone is simply all the same. There is no one. All there is is what's happened. <laughs> if you love to imagine that there are higher levels and lower levels, all there is is what's happened. Apparently. Thank you. Sank goes, hi, Tony. I love your smile. Is there any situation in which the communication of this message would be inappropriate, such as talking with someone who's just been traumatized, raped, etc.? What does that open secret think about real wounding at an emotional level that could uh, paralyze one's life? Sterilize one's life? Uh, paralyze. 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 Well, I think that's a possibility, <laughs> of course. Yeah, if there's a huge impact emotionally, there could be a closing down of the body. Um, and there was another part of the question. Um, yep, asked he's of, basically saying that um, um, is there any situation in which the communication of this message could would be inappropriate? Oh yeah, okay. So this message is only a response to a, a question. For instance, where am I, or should I meditate, or what is life? There's a, if there's a genuine uh, question, there will be a response out of this if it if it obviously hears it, and that's all it does. This message isn't something that needs broadcast or would would be appropriate to broadcast all over the place or to anyone. I do know of dear <laughs> people I've spoken to who then rush off and say to their friends, "Hey, there's no one there," and, and so on. And that's it's it, in that sort of setting, just cold and bleak like that. It's, it simply doesn't work. It's inappropriate and of course, those people immediately reject it. Mind you, this message is rejected a great deal anyway, because it's so uncomfortable and confronting. It is also is it also an energetic movement that brings me to your message. Uh, yes, yes, you could say that. Energy is all there is, and energy can bring a feeling of disquiet, and then that feeling of disquiet obviously brings a seeking, and it's possible that that, that, that seeking energy will be attracted to this message. Thank There's you. nobody doing it. There is no intention for anybody to hear this message or for anybody to become enlightened because being unenlightened and being totally separate is absolutely, is absolute wholeness. Let's be clear about that. There isn't a separate thing called dualism that isn't also oneness. This is from no one. Tony, in my own investigation around today's topic, it's been interesting to see the large proportion of non-dual speakers who mention you as being significant in their own journeys, including a number of today's speakers. Have you noticed any correlations? As you don't offer any practice, do you, do you have any ideas who, why this might be? No, well, just that it is, that's what's happened again. So I mean, I've, I've spoken to for 25 years about this message, this non-uncompromising message. And for quite a few parts, a few of those years, I, as far as I could tell, I was the only one really broadcasting this sort of message. And people were attracted to it and naturally things began to happen or not happen, <laughs> actually. <laughs> But the things that started to not happen and, and, and a sense of separation seemed to fall, fall away. And uh, since that time, some people who came felt that they would also like to communicate this message, and that's what they're doing. Yep. Oh, now your voice is gone. Oh, when I was interviewing a lot oh, of people, uh, a lot uh, of speakers for this conference, uh, they always go back to you they're like oh i went to tony meeting i'm like how did you get started or you know what happened and they always uh you know give you give you props there tony <laughs> uh, alexander asked oh no no anonymous asked what can we do or not do to speed up enlightenment <laughs> oh sweetheart that's so sweet it's lovely there isn't any there isn't anything to speed up because already already everything is enlightenment Already, everything is whole. 
already everything is no thing there's nothing to do there's no one to do it all that's in the way of those who seek enlightenment is the idea that they have to find it that's all or that something's going to happen it is, it is true that a lot of individual seekers feel that something needs to happen before they can find what they long for uh, what what can arise is the sudden dropping away of the idea or the belief that something has to happen and then all that's left is what seems to be happening is nothing apparently happening alexander asks is your experience of sleep the same as everybody else's is your experience yes, uh, of, of sleep oh. the same as everybody else's Oh, I don't know, because I've never been to sleep to sleep with anybody. <laughs> I don't know. How do I know that? No. All I can say is that in deep sleep, the sense of me is no more, and all there is is what seems to be happening. Thank you, Tony. Uh, can you feel possessiveness or jealousy in a romantic relationship after liberation? Can there even actually be a romantic relationship after liberation? Or is that scene a just just as a story that the character is just playing along in? It's a, it's a, well, falling in love, as I said, is something very near to what we're talking about, but it's still in the story. But after um, liberation, there is no need to maintain anything of that kind anymore because there is already only in loveness. So the idea that in some way or other relationships need, need to be... Uh, maintained or worked on is completely ridiculous because there's no one left there never was anyone left of course all there is already is unconditional love and 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 in that sense there's no idea that there should be a quality of love or an exchange of love maintained in any way there's no need to maintain anything and also there is no one anyway so there's no choice uh, there simply is unconditional love Ishwara says, thank you, Tony. Heart, heart, heart. Thank you, Tony. Heart, heart, heart. <laughs> oh, thank you. Sha <laughs> Shannon, uh, Shannon goes, I love your laugh. Why do you think some people take this all so seriously? No, because they're still in, in some way or other, if they're really serious, they're still trying to get somewhere. It feels to me as a seriousness, if it's constant, is an, is an attempt to make something happen. The, the, you know, this is so joyful. It's just a joyful, it's unknowing wonder. Why wouldn't there be joy and laughter? And also, of course, there is sadness and all those things arise. But all they are is what's apparently happening. Thank you. Harvey asks, when teachers talk about the I am, what does that mean in your teaching? What, uh, when teachers talk about the I am, what does that mean in your teaching? It means nothing. It means they're speaking from dualism. There is no I to be am. There is no I to be am. There is no self. There is simply what, I'm sorry to be really boring about this, but all there is is what's apparently happening. And no one's in it. There is no one in what's happening. It just is what's happening. Did you just prescribe a practice? Say all there is is your, what's Actually, happening? your voice is breaking up. Your voice is breaking up. Did you just prescribe a practice? Oh. So, oh. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Just a second. Um, can you hear me now? No. All right. <laughs> uh, did you just, pres according to Anonymous, did you just prescribe a practice? Say all there is is what's happening. Say all, is, uh, all there is is what's happening. Is, is that a practice? Of course not. I've already, I've already tried to be as clear as possible about what's happening. I said at the beginning, all there is is what's apparently happening. There's no experience of it and no knowing of it. There is no one in it. There is just what seems to be happening. There's nothing apparently happening. 
there's nothing else in it you, you obviously didn't hear that or didn't didn't want to hear it there is a lot of a selective deafness that goes on with these sort of talks isa goes the experience that with the falling away of the apparent me the apparent physical form of the me comes to a state of health meaning that there are no more or way less pains, illnesses, etc. experienced? No, not at all. Um, what seems to happen uh, is that, well, first of all, all the time there's a sense of separation, there's a tension in the body because there's a feeling of living in threat. Mm -hmm. non, the non-dual apparent world seems to be threatening, so there's a sense of tension and tightness in the body. When, the, when that uh, illusion of being anyone falls away, the body relaxes but that wouldn't mean that there wouldn't be illness all those sort of things can still happen or could be happening and they are what is happening Errol asks, and nobody, oh, and nobody so. knows them or experiences them did you hear that there oh. is no one there is no <laughs> one in what is happening there is only what is happening <laughs> Daryl asks, do you still have a sense of time or is time just another happening? Uh, time is another appearance uh, and there can be a sense of time uh, for convenience sake there's a sense of time when you're cooking well, there, there would be a sense of time but it's only simply a calculation that, that happens it's another thing that's apparently happening <laughs> And Anz asks, if the Buddha were to time travel <laughs> to this webinar, what questions would you ask him? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kwe, I wouldn't ask him any question because the answer would be, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, a deluded answer. Because for me, Buddhism is a teaching that lives in the dualistic world. Thank you. Anonymous asks, would you comment on the way mainstream society regards illness? It seems that mainstream society is uh, ascribing a good label to health and a bad label to illness, when actually both events are neutral. Things would simply, if we would see that illness is just another thing that is happening, over to you, Tony. <laughs> well, we, it isn't we that will see that illness is over, only happening when there is no separation any longer. It, it, there isn't anything that sees that all there is is what's happening. There isn't anything that knows that all there is is happening, as you are the friend listening. All there is is what is apparently happening. and There's no one in it and there's nothing, nothing more than, than that. It's very, very simple uh, what is happening. Um, and Oh, I forgot, you said something about the illness. Did you say something about illness? Illness and, um, let me just a second. I've forgotten what the... <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, describing a good label to health and bad label to oh, illness. Oh, yeah, okay. So in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dualistic world, there is good and bad. So everything will be labelled good, bad, better, worse, and so on. That's a constant in the in the in the dualistic world because the dualistic world is full of judgment about everything. Thank you. Uh, the next question is: What advice can you give us from anonymous? <laughs> none, none. No, there is no advice because there is no one to advise. All there is. Is what's apparently happening. <laughs> uh, Tony uh, is anonymous again. Is there a possibility for the me to turn the contemporary information about non duality into mind concept so that it can become a new kind of religion in order to improve itself through a new non duality theory? Well, of course it's possible, and what will be reduced from it will be complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> okay uh corey when there are no boundaries me or self no idea of self 
it seems to be infinite, but really there's no such thing as infinite as a concept. Is it infinite? Oh, not, no, sorry. Is it infinite and infinite that cannot be described? Is it infinitely everything or is it just a mystery? It's a mystery. It's, an inf it's the infinite mystery. It can't be known or described. Uh, and there can't be any concept about that which can't be known or described. All there is is the infinite, if you like. There's so many words. All there is is wholeness. All there is is nothing is everything. All there is is empty formless. All there is is formless form. You can go on and on and on. But trying to see or understand any of those concepts is a completely futile activity. Ah, oh, your voice. Where your voice have you? Around. There it is. There it is. There it is. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Where else have you found this message being expressed, Tony? I haven't found it nowhere else. There are other people that now express it, but up in well, the time when I started expressing it, as far as I could tell, there was no one else that was expressing it. Um, I looked, but I couldn't find anybody. In all the places I looked, there were teachers. There were teachers and people trying to give the world and the story some sort of value which it doesn't have. Ishwara says, what, what is it that feels a relief hearing this message? Oh. Um, it's just a sense of, of other. It's a sense, it's a bit like uh, I was saying before, uh, there's, something, there's something that's beyond what we're talking about. There's something else that's beyond all of these these um, ideas we're having, all of these explanations we're giving. I'm giving explanations here, and throughout the next day there'll be many, many explanations. But there's something else that's completely beyond those explanations. It's like, again, being in love. You can explain to somebody why you love somebody else, but there is something else that can't be explained. That's what's going on right now in everybody, wherever they are, sitting there hearing this. And even if they're not hearing this and they're down the road having a pint, there is something else which can't be described. Wow. It's this. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, Mark asks, explain how Buddhism is a dualistic, is dualistic. Oh, it's simple. It's a teaching. Buddhism sees the individual as someone who can choose to meditate and become enlightened. I'm being very simplistic now, but that's how it is. And the seven forms of enlightenment in Buddhism, I have a friend who is a lecturer in Buddhism. We discuss this very closely. Together. The seven forms of enlightenment in Buddhism are all personal, all to do with the promise of personal enlightenment. So obviously the whole thing. Anonymous asks, can you talk about awareness and what your message is on awareness, please? Oh, awareness is simply another um, formula or another process which keeps the person separate. Awareness uh, uh, needs something for it to be aware of. So sitting in, in a simple way to answer this, all the time there is an individual they may not know it, but they are aware of sitting on a seat. So there is one, an individual, and two, the awareness of sitting on a seat. So this is pure dualism. So, um, awareness, consciousness are other words for knowing. I know I am. I know I am sitting on a seat. I know I am what I am. This is all pure dualism. When the whole illusion of there being anyone falls away, what falls away with it immediately is awareness and consciousness. Mm. There's no one that knows. All there is is the is, is unknown wonder. All that's left is unknowing wonder. Beautiful. Well, Tony, uh, that was fast. We We did it. We Thank did you. it, man. We, we did, did it, it, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Well, well, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
We're going to we're going to sell wall carpets from now on. Okay. We'll yeah, yeah, a, yeah. We'll, we'll a special do it. thing. Yeah. Wall I'll carpets. Ten, I'll give you ten percent. Yes. <laughs> it um, doesn't matter. Also, Claire and I want to thank you and Noel for doing all of this. Oh, we're very grateful. And, and, and part of the, the, the lovely thing about doing it is meeting you both. Oh, thank Especially you. talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank and you. One day, we'll meet. That's right. Let's, let's do the retreat. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Well, 